vulnerabilities in ActiveX objects. Uh, with Internet Explorer 7 and the ActiveX hardening, we're probably going to see less of this, but the techniques are still applicable to uh, vulnerabilities in MSHTML and other Internet, Internet Explorer components. So Windows processes usually have, um, they, they have at least one heap, which is called the default process heap, and it's created during the process initialization. Uh, but they can also create special dedicated heaps. Um, so different components do have the capability to use different heaps. Uh, if we look at what kind of heaps the different Internet Explorer pieces use, we'll see that most of them actually use the default process heap because using a special heap requires more work. So it's easier for the programmer to just call, uh, to just call heap alloc and not pass, not pass a special heap. Uh, so MSHTML uses the default process heap. Uh, JavaScript, the JavaScript engine uses a special heap for its objects. So if you create a, uh, an array object or some other kind of object, it will go on, on the special heap. But the strings that you create go on the default process heap. And this is very good for us because we want to use the strings because they give us the capability to control the data inside the allocated blocks. Uh, the ActiveX objects, most of them use the default process heap. Uh, there are some that would use dedicated heaps, but um, in the exploits that I've had to develop, uh, the default process heap was the only one that I really had to be concerned with. So let's look at how JavaScript treats, uh, treats strings and how it stores them in the, in the memory. Uh, the strings are stored as uh, BSDR structures. Uh, it's an OLE type. Um, you have the string data, which is in Unicode, so each character takes two bytes. The string data is preceded by four bytes of string size, uh, and after that you have a two-byte null terminator. So if you have, if you have the string AAAA, uh, it'll take a uh, total of uh, eight, ten, uh, 14 bytes. 4 bytes for the size, 8 bytes for the uh, string data, and 2 bytes for the null terminator. Uh, so we can use the two formulas that are shown up there on the slide to calculate uh, how many bytes uh, how many bytes would be required to store a string of a specific length. Uh, we can also go the other way um, and calculate if we want to allocate a block of a specific size in bytes, how long does the string need to be that we're going to create? So, for example, this here shows that if you need a 14-byte uh, block to be allocated on the heap, uh, you have to use a four-character string. Um, now, one, one little catch is that uh, all the sizes are actually rounded up to 16. So, uh, it'll be a 16-byte uh, block instead of 14. Uh, so string allocation in JavaScript is not very hard. Now the obvious way you're going to do it, which is with a string literal shown there on the first line, is not going to work because the string, the string literals are pre-allocated when the JavaScript code is parsed. But if you create a string dynamically during the execution of the JavaScript, uh, which can be done using the substring function or by concatenating two other strings, uh, the JavaScript interpreter will allocate a new block of the size that you requested, and it will fill it with the data that you want. So these, uh, these, two, uh, these two methods there give us the ability to allocate blocks of an arbitrary size with arbitrary contents, and that is very powerful. The second half of the puzzle is how to do free operations. Now, JavaScript is garbage collected. There is no way to explicitly free a piece of data. Uh, there is no free function that you can call in your string. It uses a mark and sweep. Uh, the, the Microsoft JavaScript interpreter uses a mark and sweep algorithm for garbage collection, which means that it walks through all the objects that have been allocated, and it checks uh, which ones of them are no longer referenced and then it frees all of those. 
it's triggered by a number of different heuristics, um, one of which is if you've allocated, I believe if you allocated a thousand new objects, that will trigger the garbage collector to run. Uh, there are other ones. Uh, I think they're being continuously tweaked. Um, but what we're going to use is the undocumented collect garbage function, which you can call directly from JavaScript, and it just executes the garbage collector. So we don't have to rely on any heuristics to trigger the garbage collector. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat function, and I'm glad that they put it there. So here's a little example of how we're actually going to allocate and free uh, blocks on the heap. We have two functions there, alloc, which takes the size of the block in bytes, the block that we want to allocate. And then we have a free function. Now the alloc function will take the size in bytes. It will calculate how many, how many characters we need in our strings, which is bytes minus six divided by two. Um, and then it will use the, the substring method to chop off a piece of the padding string. The padding string is just a very long string um, that it, it has to be uh, as long as the largest allocation that you're ever want to gonna do um, in your JavaScript code. So we're gonna use the substring method to just take this many characters and this will allocate a block of that size in bytes. Um, and on the bottom there, on the next to last line, we're going to call the alloc function uh, to allocate 64k of memory. Then we're going to call the free function to free that string. The free function will set the str variable to null, which deletes the only active reference in the JavaScript code to that string object. And then we will call the garbage collector. The garbage collector will notice that there are no references to the string and it will pass the string to the uh, free function. So with this code, we have the ability to allocate strings of arbitrary sizes, arbitrary data, and free them arbitrarily. Unfortunately, when I first implemented this, it turned out that it didn't work very well. It didn't work always. Sometimes I was getting uh, very weird results. So I had to go and reverse some code, and what I found out is that the string were not actually allocated directly from the system memory allocator, but they were allocated through uh, OLI aut 32 DLL, which implemented a custom caching scheme on top of the standard memory allocator. Uh, the point of the caching system was to, um, to have blocks that have been freed um, to store them without actually releasing them to the system and the next allocation that happens after that will get one of the cached blocks instead of going all the way down to the system memory allocator. Uh, it is not very clear why it's there because I, I think that the system memory allocator with its look asides and especially the low fragmentation heap in the most recent versions is probably much much better than this uh, caching scheme but it's probably just a piece of old code that was left from long time ago. Uh, so this caching allocator uses four bins for blocks of different sizes. So for example, blocks between 0 and 32 bytes go into the first bin, blocks between 32 and 64 into the second bin, and so on. So we have like four categories of blocks. Then I think blocks larger than uh, I think 32k just get freed directly, so there's no caching for them. Uh, and each bin contains up to, it, it's an array that contains up to six free blocks. So if your cache for a certain size uh, is full, then uh, you can no longer, um, and, and then you free a block of that size, it's not going to go into the cache. It will just go directly to the system allocator and will get freed. Um, here's how the alloc and the free functions actually work. And what we want to do is, like, the, the reason we're looking at this memory allocator is because we want to ensure that all of our allocations come from the system memory allocator uh, instead of the cache. And we also want to make sure that when we free a block, it goes directly to the system heap uh, instead of getting stored into the cache. Uh, 
So to do this, we need to understand how the alloc and the free functions work. Um, and you can look at the paper that accompanies the presentation, and I have way more detail about how the allocator actually works. But here's a very short overview. Uh, when, we allocate, when we allocate a block using this allocator, uh, first we find the right bin for this block based on its size. If that bin is empty, which means that there's no cache blocks of this size, then we just get a new, we just allocate a new block from the system, from the system allocator. If the bin is not empty and contains some blocks, we find the smallest block that can satisfy that allocation request, and then we return that block. Uh, if there are no blocks that are large enough there, we also go to the system allocator. It's a pretty simple algorithm. And the free, the, f the, the algorithm used by the free function is uh, also, also pretty straightforward. If the bin for, the, for, for our size is not full, we're just going to add the block to it. If it is full, we're going to find the smallest block, the smallest cache block, and if it's smaller than our current block that we're freeing, we're going to replace it. So what the allocator is trying to do there is uh, keep the six largest blocks that have been freed inside the cache. So it's trying to maximize the amount of memory that is being cached. Um, so from the, free, from the free function, one interesting thing to note is that if, we, if you free like a large block when it's getting freed, we'll push out a small block. It'll push it out of the cache. So, and, and, and the bin can contain only up to six blocks. So if we free six maximum sized blocks for a particular bin, they will push out all smaller blocks out of the cache. And now the cache will contain only these six blocks. Then, if we allocate these six blocks again, uh, they'll come out of the cache and they'll leave the cache empty. And once the cache is empty, we can do more allocations, and the allocations will come from the system allocator, guaranteed. Uh, this is what I call the plunger technique uh, for bypassing the only alt 32 cache. So we're going to start with an empty cache. And first, we're going to allocate six maximum size blocks from each bin. And they're shown in blue on the slide over there. So we've allocated them. The next step is we're going to allocate some blocks of whatever sizes we need for our exploit. Uh, there they are, the green blocks. Uh, since the cache was empty, the green blocks came from the system allocator. Then we're going to free uh, some of the green blocks, and they will go into the cache. And this is what we want to avoid, because uh, having them in the cache will prevent other pieces, other components of IE, uh, such as ActiveX controls, from getting these particular blocks, because ActiveX objects don't use the same allocator. They use the system allocator, but not the uh, OLE allocator. So to push these blocks out, we're going to use the six maximum size blocks, the blue ones. We're going to use them as a plunger going through a tube. Um, and by freeing the six maximum size blocks, we're going to push out the, small, the smaller green ones. And then we can allocate the six maximum size blocks again, and we're going to leave the uh, cache empty. And we're going to have our blocks freed through the system allocator. So we get everything that we want. And by using this technique, we can completely ignore the uh, caching scheme that's implemented on top of the system allocator.